Make sure to check out the previous video in this series, link in the description. Taken from the journal of explorer Philip Parker King. March 12th, 1818, Arnhem Land. The big river in the Never Never. That's what that idiot, Captain Cadell, had told me to look for. But did he give me coordinates? Perhaps a geographer? Of course not. That stuffy bureaucrat just wants a slab of land to pass the defecate of a capital idea, Palmerston, through the lower intestine of his vapid brain and out onto the red dirt for all to see. And as it cooks in the abominable heat with the rest of us, I only hope the smell makes him choke. But I don't think I'll include that in my official report. This big river I've been sent to find is supposed to be surrounded by dense bushland, fertile soil and the sort. Cadell wants to cut it all down so that he can finally found his capital city fever dream. And whilst I've never been one to stand in the way of progress, I can't help but feel this plan of his is a tad short-sighted. Who would want to live up here? No. Yes, we've got a settlement or two in Arnhem Land, but a capital city? What industry would sustain it? How could it even be accessed? Does Cadell expect prospectors to circumnavigate the damned country just to get to his beloved Palmerston? I digress. The 2nd of April, 1818. After weeks of travel, I think I finally found a suitable candidate. I found a body of water downstream from an impressive river. Following the river a ways up, I came to, well, what I can only describe as an explosion of greenery. This has to be some of, if not the densest bush I have ever seen. Although, it does seem well, odd. Eucalypts in the sort don't usually grow this closely together. And the arid yet tropical nature of the surrounds would lead one to think that the most growth you'd find is short and dry. Glorified kindling. But this forest matches the descriptions of the great woods of northern Europe, even the Amazons. I'll have to find another way through. It's curious, though. The wind that blows through here almost sounds like whispers. I'm sure that'll fuel the superstitions of the nearby natives. The 4th of April, 1818. I found a group of natives today. An untrusting bunch. They weren't overly fond of my being here and were predictably uncooperative. I suppose I can't blame them, though. After so many clashes with outsiders, I can understand their standoffishness. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't frustrated. I didn't want anything but information, just a way through the forest. Yet they treated me like I was some sort of pillager. An inaccurate and unfair summation. That honor almost certainly goes to Cadell and his lot. Should Palmerston happen, these people will almost certainly be displaced. Reluctantly though, I admit that I am playing a part. I may not be the one building the city, but I'm still an integral role. If only things were simpler. If only everyone could get what they wanted like in the picture books I read as a child. Oh well. Their English wasn't very good, and my understanding of their dialect was also subpar. But from what I could make out, there were repetitions of the words river and garcane. Such a difficult language to understand. 
Do not step, one of the men managed to get out, and then gestured to the forest, then gave an approximation of a thumbs up and pointed to the river. I sighed, but in thanks I offered him and the other natives a portion of my rations. From what I could understand, he was telling me that the forest is far too dense to cut through on foot. Rather, the only way through is by canoe. I'll see if I can trade for a canoe. Then, first thing, I'm going upstream. <sighs> of course, it had to be upstream. Damn you, Cadell. I bet your mother serves the crown on her back. The 6th of April, 1818. The river is far longer than expected. I have been having to moor the canoe and sleep in it, so I don't get pushed back downstream. It's strange. I could very easily pull the canoe to shore and camp on solid ground, but... There's something about the forest I can't quite place. I feel this dread deep inside when I look to the trees on either side of the river. I desperately do not want to step foot on the ground here. Daft, I know. But either way, I'll be completing my job, so where I sleep and how I sleep, I hardly think matters. My current state of mind I blame on the wind. At night, it sounds clearly like people. Whispers and wails. I should like to bring a scientist back with me to study them. Perhaps it has something to do with the trees. Maybe the way the bark forms alters the sound of the wind. But, to be honest, these things, these hypotheticals I spew out, I just tell myself to cope. In truth, I'm petrified. I know God wouldn't allow for any devilish creatures to exist, but that childish part of my brain still needs convincing. The 12th of April, 1818. I feel like I'm not moving. Every day, I row, and every day the river stretches out ahead of me. Barely any light gets through the canopy, and the water barely reflects what little light does get through, as it is so full of dirt that it's opaque. That's right, the water is opaque, for God's sake. Couldn't even drink it if I got thirsty. The whispers aren't just at night anymore. I hear them all day, every day. I can't tell if they're filling the forest or... or if they're following me. There are no birds or sounds of creatures playing in the leaves. There's just... the whispers. Always the whispers. God, why won't they let me sleep? The 13th of April, 1818. I don't know how to start this entry. I keep rewriting it and rewriting it over and over and over again. But no matter what, the words just won't come out right. I keep thinking I sound mad or stupid. I was fed up with the river. After so many days, I figured the natives must have made a fool of me. Perhaps this is a circular water system or something. There's no way I should still be in here. The whispers were so loud and constant. I just wanted to be away from them. Out in the open, in my little canoe, I felt so... vulnerable. So I gave in. I pulled the canoe to shore and made footfall in the forest. And that's when it happened. The moment my foot hit the soil, 
the whispers, the wails, the speaking in the trees, the cacophony of sound stopped. Days of noise, then a wall of silence. My blood ran cold, and naturally I froze. I changed my mind and turned to run back to the canoe. And that's when I saw him. I only say him because the thing roughly resembled a man, but it was no human. He stood over me, towered actually. He seemed to reach into the trees on either side and above him. From his back, giant leathery wings sprouted like that of a bat. I was horrified when they cracked out and reached for me. I stumbled backwards, narrowly dodging them. His body creaked and groaned like dry bark as he moved closer to me, wings arcing back to try and snatch me again. Despite my exhaustion, I threw myself up and ran for it, deeper and deeper into the forest. There was a tremendous, thunderous gust of wind that almost toppled me over as the thing behind me took to the sky in pursuit. What matter of godless creature was this? So I ran, panting hard, my throat burned with unexpected exercise. I manically scanned the forest around me for some clearing, some break. And as I did, I saw them, those who made the whispers. There were people like me. Their bodies were blue and transparent. They didn't seem to notice me. They just shuffled about and wept. I made a quick prayer, but no salvation came. The monster landed in front of me. The force of his landing shook the ground and I fell tumbling. I screamed and thrashed as he effortlessly plucked me up with his wings and pushed me close to his chest, using those wings to almost crush me into it, smother me. I tried to scream again, but then these, these tendril-like things from his chest came out and forced their way down my open throat. For the first time in my life, I could feel the inside of my lungs as the tendrils traveled down my throat and probed around, blindly feeling around my insides. I felt my bones cracking and creaking under the pressure of the wings, and my vision grew dark as he sucked the life from me. It was over. I was over. But then, he stopped. I felt his body tense, and an inhuman voice barked. What? The voice was so nearly human that it made my insides turn. The monster sounded like one half of a conversation. You dare make demands of me? The tendrils withdrew and I felt air rush back to me. Ndubi filth! The monster's voice boomed and then he threw me away like an unwanted dolly. I don't remember what happened after that. Maybe I hit a tree? Maybe I was poisoned? Either way, the first thing I can remember is stumbling, battered, bruised, and exhausted out of the forest. This account shall remain with me, and only me. I'm smart enough to know that this will get me committed or worse if I bring it up. As for Palmerston? Cadell be damned. He can build his city somewhere else. I'll probably just find somewhere a few hundred miles from here and say that that's the perfect spot. I don't think I'll ever know what happened. But I'm lucky to be alive. His name is Garke, the demon of the Liverpool River. Garkane is an interesting case, not just a creature, but an evil spirit. He makes his home in the Liverpool River's surrounding bushland. 
for as long as tribes have existed around the area. They have told tales of hunters and travellers going into that forest, never to be seen alive again. Garkane kills all who enter his forest. But interestingly, he is not a hunter. Whilst his motives are unknown, it could be argued that he is a sort of protector figure. But is he protecting the forest or something within it? Garkane stands at 12 feet tall. Vaguely humanoid, he has dark skin and massive bat-like leathery wings that sprout from his back. These wings are Garkane's primary weapon. He kills his victims by ensnaring them in his wings and then using them to smother them to death. Whilst being killed by Garkane, he will tear out the soul of his victim and then devour them, leaving nothing but bones. But one of the most fascinating things about Garkane is that he is not a soul eater. Either he tears out his victim's souls for flavour or just to be cruel. You see, those souls torn out by Garkane are not consumed and they do not pass on. Instead, all those who were killed by Garkane are doomed to wander his forest as a lost soul for all eternity. It is said that if you listen closely to the wind of the forest, you can hear the cries and wails of all those Garkane has killed. But why does this happen? Does Garkane curse them? Does contact with him leave some magical effect on the soul? Maybe. One other interesting idea that poses more questions than answers is that, in fact, the forest is the one that entraps Garkane's victims. Perhaps the forest itself is magical. So that brings us back to the biggest question of all surrounding Garkane. What is he? Hunter? Protector? Or is he trying to keep people away from the forest? for their sake. G'day guys, thanks for listening to that video. and. Before I head off today, I just want to give a special thanks to my beautiful patrons, Lady Nevermore, Catherine Gordon, The Curator, and Skulk Queen. If you see them in the comment section, please say good day.